so much to to Beth and to um, Rachel for having me. I really appreciate them them thinking about me when they were putting this together. Um, so again, I'm I'm Kristen Stafford. Uh, I'm an epidemiologist by training, um, but that's only recent. Uh, before that, um, I was a number of different things, which I'm going to hopefully talk to you all about. If uh, anyone can't hear me well, just ping in the chat, and I'll try and speak up. Um, but I'll go ahead and get started. All right, so I'm gonna go over kind of my public health career path, uh, what working in the field looked like, although I'm not gonna spend a great deal of time on that, uh, cause I know Dr. Schumann's gonna talk a great deal about cultural competency. And then hopefully I'm gonna give you um, some tips and they're somewhat tried, um, but hopefully true tips for getting your first job in global health. So, where did my path start? Uh, one of the questions that was presented to us that came in before the, the webinar was, what were the speakers' deliberate educational and training steps that enabled them to get the careers they're currently in? Um, so I'd like to start by saying that my bachelor's was not a deliberate step to getting me where I ended up in, um, in international health and global health. I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do. Um, when I went to college. So my, my first degree is a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology with a minor in Literature and Art. I clearly was not looking for a lucrative career of any kind <laughs> or even necessarily to be highly employable upon graduation. Um, I just knew that I, you know, I, I wanted to help people and that's where the psychology was and I like to read and I was a, a painter at the time. So that was um, four years well spent. Um, and if you meet my parents, tell them it was four years well spent. Uh, but what happened after that is really what led to my public health career. So, you know, these 39 easy steps, steps two to 35 were really the next 10 years of my career. Um, what I call the, you know, we don't eat well, but sleep well phase of my career. So it was lots of jobs working with uh, marginalized populations, uh, people with HIV, starting with um, developmentally disabled and chronically mentally ill individuals, among whom there was a large proportion who were showing up HIV positive. And this is in the mid 90s. It was um, earlier on in the HIV epidemic. And I went from that to working with people who were, who were homebound. Um, I worked in the prison for, for three years as an HIV case manager. I worked with kids with HIV and then worked my way up to managing Ryan White funded programs. Um, and after doing that for a while, I realized that I had kind of reached the end of my skill set and, and I actually lost the bet. So again, not a deliberate step, but the punishment for losing the bet was having to apply for the MPH. And I did, and I, I lucked into getting into Hopkins and I did my MPH at Hopkins. I did my MPH in health policy and management. Um, it was a great program. It was the 11 month program. So it was full time, um, highly intensive for anyone who's doing an MPH, you know how intensive they can be. Um, so I did that and I successfully created, uh, completed my MPH in health policy and management. And then I realized I really didn't want to do health policy. It wasn't even close to what I wanted to do. Um, I learned a lot about it. I picked up a lot of good skills, but it wasn't what I wanted to do. And I once again made a non-deliberate choice and uh, I lucked into a job uh, with the Institute of Human Virology who had just landed one of the first uh, multi-country PEPFAR grants. Um, and I got a job to help build their new eight country PEPFAR program. And one of the recurrent themes I think I'm gonna come back to throughout my, my brief talk here is, um, when my, my boss offered me the job and I explained that I had never worked in resource limited settings, he said, you've worked in Baltimore for 12 years. Um, it's applicable. Uh, you have the skill set that, that I need. So take the job. And two weeks later, I was in Haiti. So I spent the next six and a half years um, in progressive kind of jobs, responsibilities. I started out trying to set up our program management structure because that was that was part of what I had done domestically. Um, and then I went, I got promoted. I did about six months of program management and then became a technical program manager working more on the care delivery system. And then I became the director of our outcomes and evaluation program. And that's where I spent the majority of that six and a half years was 
designing and implementing our um, program level monitoring and evaluation and particularly our patient level outcomes. Spent about 50% of my time overseas, um, averaged out across those six years, it was a lot more. The first four years, a lot less, the last two. Um, and we supported about 240 clinics in those eight countries, reaching about 700,000 people living with HIV. So I was cruising along quite well. Um, I was definitely enjoying my job. Um, I was fully immersed in global health and HIV treatment in particular. And so I thought that was a perfect time to quit my perfectly good job and go back to school. Um, I, had, I had really reached kind of the limit of my skill set and seeing what I wanted to do, uh, I knew that the PhD was the, the correct step for me. So I went back and I did my PhD in epidemiology. Um, and after that, I, I skipped the postdoc and I came back to the University of Maryland as a faculty member. And so what I'm doing now is I spend about 40% of my time dedicated to our international programs and about 60% on domestic research. Um, so that's kind of my, my meandering career path to becoming a, a, an international health or public health professional in an international setting. Um, and but I wanted to talk a little bit about what I got out of each of those steps. So, you know, what some may call a fairly wasted liberal arts um, education. I looking back, I know some of the things I gained that I was able to apply to my global health career uh, were for one writing skills. Writing skills end up being um, critically important. Um, just learning how to learn, learning how to learn new things is a big part of a liberal arts education. For all of you who are either just finishing your bachelor's or did a liberal arts education, it's not wasted. Um, you do learn a great deal. And I also was able to demonstrate that I was trainable, right? So I, I did what I needed to do for four years and, and came out with a degree. That, next, that step two to 35, these incremental jobs I took um, working with marginalized populations with HIV in Baltimore really became the foundation for my international career. And some of the things I, I, I got out of those 10 years before I did my MPH were lots of cultural competencies. As you know, a white middle-class woman from the suburbs of Virginia, um, I was thrust into predominantly African-American poor communities in Baltimore and it's a, it was a completely different culture. So learning how to acquire those cultural competencies, how to demonstrate cultural competency was a big part of my career development. Also picked up some grant writing, definitely a lot of team building, certainly perseverance. Um, and I also picked up mentors and colleagues and connections along the way, as well as the content specific knowledge around HIV that became really important when PEPFAR was launched. Um, during my MPH, even though I didn't end up staying in health policy and management, um, I was exposed to just a broad um, swath of public health concepts that I really didn't get from my bachelor's or even from, from the work experience I had after my bachelor's degree. Um, it helped me figure out what I wasn't passionate about. Unfortunately, it was my MPH concentration. Um, but it also helped me really figure out what it was I was passionate about, and that was direct service. That was really providing the actual public health and not creating the policies that would then guide public health programs. And again, I picked up mentors and colleagues and connections. Um, when I started working for the University of Maryland on our, on our PEPFAR program, that's where I got my international experience. Um, definitely a lot more cultural competency, working in eight countries. A much broader worldview. I, I picked up some teaching experience, more mentors, more mentees at this point, more colleagues. There's definitely a lot of grant writing. That's something that I would encourage everyone to spend some time picking up skills in. Um, and when I met the kind of limit of my skill set, I figured out what I really wanted to do in the future. And then, of course, along the way, I also picked up malaria, dengue, a whole bunch of parasites, lots of amoebas. And the one major bonus was I got the first piece of furniture that no one else had ever owned thanks to my airline miles, which I cashed in when I quit my job. So there's all kinds of ancillary benefits you don't even think about when you're traveling full-time for a living. During my PhD, it was really the depth of knowledge in epidemiology that was gonna lie, you know, lead me into the next phase of my career in, in global health. 
So it was a new skill set um, applicable to many fields, but particularly what I wanted to do internationally with HIV. Um, a different set of cultural competencies dealing with an academic environment, more mentors, more mentees, and um, now my niece and nephew call me doctor, which is kind of fun. In my academic appointment, which is the phase of my career I'm in now, um, you know, you, you see that I keep talking about mentors, mentees, and colleagues, and this is really the foundation to building a career, is making some of those connections. It provided me with some opportunities to collaborate, um, to move into the research phase of my career, some more training, and luckily, it's really provided me with the opportunity to go back to Sub-Saharan Africa, which when, when I left the PEPFAR job, I didn't know for sure that I was going to get. Um, and I wanted to walk through this schematic I gave you before to show you how it really all connected. Um, and so that first connection, when I was working uh, domestically with marginalized populations, that's where I got the impetus to go on to get my MPH, and it's where my my um, letters of recommendation came from and some of the connections that I had. And because I was coming in with a bunch of work experience, it was a little bit different than some of my classmates who had done a couple of years in Peace Corps and only had a couple of years in. So it was, it was a nice um, place to come from for an exchange. The other thing I got from that, those years working here in, in Baltimore and around Maryland was that's how I actually ended up landing the job with the Institute of Human Virology. Um, my Dr. Redfield, who's my boss and who had got this major grant, um, he was one of the people that I provided services to his patients when I was with several of the, the nonprofits I worked with. And then also I became his funder when I was with the Brian White program. So when I finished my MPH and was looking for a job, um, he knew who I was and he knew what my skill set was and offered and offered me the job out of my MPH. Um, that also landed, you know, coming back to the University of Maryland after my PhD. But the other thing that early career development did is um, many of the organizations I worked with when I was doing case management work, when I was when I was um, managing Ryan White funding. Um, those are now people that I collaborate with for my both my domestic and my international research. So everything really remained connected and built upon itself. So while it wasn't um, up until my PhD, that's really the only deliberate um, step I took in, in fostering my own career. But everything really, in, in retrospect, built upon it um, to get me where I was in international health. So what I do now really is I provide epi methods and biostatistics support for all of our international programs. I teach epi methods and basic biostats to our teams in the field. Um, most of the time I was working with PEPFAR, um, we were very, very focused on capacity development and transferring capacity to the local partners. And so now I'm doing that um, at just a slightly different level with a slightly different skill set. I write a lot of grants, I do teach at the graduate level, and then my own independent research now is really focused on HIV and aging, which is a huge evolution in my career from when I started and people were dying all the time to now people are living. And that's my focus, is the kind of the coming epidemic of HIV and aging in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, what the field looks, you know, working in the field, what it looks like. So I've given you two pictures here. On the left-hand side, that's my you know, fresh out of my MPH, uh, first trip to Haiti, that's up in Northern in Haiti in Okap. Um, we went walking around, um, that's 2004. The one on the right is that my second to last trip um, after the earthquake, coming back, um, that's not just fatigue, I had dengue fever. Um, so that's kind of what field work looks like. It looks happy and exciting and exhausting and, um, bone breaking all at the same time. And in between those two trips, I was in uh, Kenya, Nigeria, Rwanda, Tanzania, Uganda, and Zambia, all doing kind of the same thing, but tailoring it to each of the different contexts. Something to remember about field work um, is it's not all safaris and accolades. Uh, there is a ton of capacity and talent in resource limited setting. And I think if, if you survey the landscape of of many of the international projects now, particularly the PEPFAR projects, um, it's really about local capacity and making sure that these um, efforts are locally driven, 
that there are local organizations working on them. I think it's always important to remember, although everybody probably knows this, it's really important to remember that we are not there to save them. Um, I think that can be a real pitfall in international work. Um, it, you know, we're there to partner with, we're there to support, we're there to learn as well. There are a number of things we learned in our international HIV programs that we brought back to our clinics here in Baltimore. So it really is a two-way street. Um, it's certainly not a vacation, although if you are lucky, you will get to see some, some you know, elephants and, and things like that. But it's not a vacation. It is work. Um, cultural competency, once again, is critical. It, it drives um, how successful you will be in these in these settings. I think it's important to remember that um, you know working in uh, field work in resource limited settings. Resource limited doesn't mean that things are wrong or backwards or inferior. It literally means resource limited, and most of the time that has to do with either financial capacity or enough people, um, doctors, uh, computer programmers, nurses, these kinds of things, pharmacists. Um, so it, it doesn't mean that anything's being done wrong. It just means it's a different level of resource that's available. And I think one of the most important things that I still approach my international work with, um, and I hope many of you uh, will support, will approach your international work with, is it really is about working yourself out of a job. Um, the goal should be to leave things better than you found them um, and to make sure that the capacities you have, that your counterparts in these settings don't have, you make sure you transfer those capacities. Um, it's not like the work's going away. It's not like there won't be other opportunities, but every project I take on, I try and make sure that by the time it's finished, um, they don't need me anymore at the end of it. Uh, obligatory picture of one of the places I used to work. This is in uh, uh, Western Rwanda. The other thing I wanted to, to mention really is when you think about international health, um, you know, there are global issues that are very, very similar to issues we have here in the United States. You know, food nutrition, access to healthy food, um, food deserts in the United States, food nutrition, sustainable agriculture is an issue overseas. Infectious diseases are a problem in both places. Poverty, education, human rights, vulnerable children. These international health issues aren't issues that other countries have that we're going to fix. There's also opportunities to develop skills in these areas right here in the good old United States that can then be applied other places. So this is my town, this is Baltimore. This is an entire block of abandoned homes that have recently been painted to look nice, but are still just abandoned homes. You know, when you look at concentrated poverty in Baltimore, so many of the issues I saw when I was working in, um, in Baltimore with people with HIV are many of the same problems that um, the people I was working with overseas had. You know, their biggest problem once medication and treatment got there wasn't the HIV itself. It was really um, employment. It was education. It was security. It was opportunities. Um, these are these are all things that um, I cut my teeth on in the United States that then were able, I was able to apply other places. You know, when you look at HIV in the United States, the epidemic's not over here either. It, there were a number of questions about PEPFAR and getting involved in PEPFAR. Um, there are a number of places here in the United States where we need a PEPFAR for the U.S., um, you know, D.C. and Baltimore being one of them, but the South in particular, uh, urban South and rural, rural South, you see those really dark spots on that map. And there are, there are communities in this country that are as affected by HIV as are many of the countries still battling HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, you know, I, I saw some questions about um, women's health issues and you know, we think about things like female genital mutilation and, and, and those kinds of things as those issues, their issues overseas, when, you know, we have organizations that are battling it here in the United States. So, you know, I encourage all of you that are trying to break into international health to look for opportunities to build some of the skills you need with the same types of communities you would be serving overseas right here in the U.S. that you can then apply to the places that you would like to work internationally. 
So the part that you all signed up for, you know, are some tips. I can't offer anyone a job. I, I don't have that much funding, but I hopefully can give you a couple of tips that can um, lead you in the right direction. And, and again, that first tip really is, is that global is not a geographical term when we're talking about global health. My global health career began right here in Baltimore. Um, and I, you know, I sought jobs with marginalized communities, the same types of marginalized communities I ended up working with in Sub-Saharan Africa and Haiti. Um, so there are lots of opportunities to work with um, immigrant populations and refugee populations here that can provide some of those early cultural competencies, um, that can provide the experience of, of working with um, displaced communities. Uh, working with the elderly, this is something that, that I personally believe is going to be an increasing issue in um, in places like Sub-Saharan Africa and South America. One of the questions that came in was, how do you figure out what your niche is going to be in international health? After working in HIV for 23 years now, you know, my niche is HIV and aging. So it's working with older people with HIV. Um, so keeping that in mind, it's not all just young people. Um, vulnerable children, we have them here as well as over there. Um, being sure that you're, be sure that you're focusing on developing skills that are going to make a meaningful contribution. Wanting to help is great, um, but figuring out what really are the capacity limitations in some of the places you want to work and developing some of those skills is important. Whether those are, you know, if you're a clinician, those being a really good clinician, um, being a really good rant, grant writer or teaching people how to write. You know, one of, the, one of the things I face all the time now in working with our country teams is they would like to publish um, the results from their very successful programs, but there's not a lot of training about how to write an academic paper. So part of what I do is try and transfer that capacity so they can actually publish their results. Um, and stay informed, you know, read books, go to conferences. When you go to conferences, go with a list of people that you want to meet and um you know bring, bring a list of 20 and two people will give you at least 10 minutes or so and and those are ways to build some of those early connections but reading news sources from the areas of the world in which you want to work um can be really really important when i was working overseas most of my time before i was on my way into a particular country i made sure that i was reading the local papers to figure out what was going on um, seeking and nurturing connections. You know, I don't think I can emphasize enough that what made me successful in my global health career really were those connections I made early in my career here in Baltimore. Now, I happen to be situated in a city with two major institutions doing large amounts of, institution, of international work. So I got lucky geographically, um, but it really was um, those connections that I made that ended up really important. and were what allowed people to give me the opportunity to work for them later on. So getting to know classmates and people who are doing what you want to do. Um, and remember, people absolutely remember how you interact and treat others as well as how hard you work. I recently reached out to someone that I worked with 20 years ago and hadn't seen since um, to talk about collaborating on some data. And it was really those early connections very early in my career that gave me access to that person later in my career. Um, if you want to work in global health, either here in the United States or overseas, you have to be prepared to make sacrifices. Um, thinking about stipend based or volunteer positions. I know nobody wants to have to go through the rigmarole of starting out with volunteer positions or stipend based, but they are a foot in the door if you don't have any work experience at all. Um, another question on, on the list was about work life balance. Um, I don't have any good answers for that. Um, it is challenging. I think uh, one of the things that was hardest for me to get used to when I was overseas all the time was just how much the world marches on at home while you're gone and, and trying to find ways to stay connected is hard, but it's, but it's important. Um, some more tips, get to know the organizations that are doing the work you wanna do. You know, I, I used to search job descriptions to figure out, you know, kind of what, what skill I needed to build next. What, what was the major um, kind of impetus for the new jobs that were being um, advertised and what skill set did I need to be able to be competitive for those things? Or did we need to build within our own 
organization to remain competitive. Um, so if you don't have all those skills, you can make your ne ne next moves based on what people are advertising for. And it's, it's not easy when you have bills to pay, but I think one of the things that can make you most successful in, in whatever career, but particularly in global health, is really just try and go after jobs you're passionate about. Working in global health is not easy, especially if you're stationed overseas. Uh, so don't make it any harder than it needs to be by doing something you don't actually believe in or doing work that you're not passionate about. Um, it, it makes that time away from family and friends um, worth it in the end if you're actually really passionate about what you're doing. And so here are a couple of places you can look. Um, you know, most people, when you, when you think global health, you don't think about starting locally here in the United States, but look at your local or state health department. You'd be surprised how many international connections some of them have. Um, I recently learned that the, the state health department in Wyoming is doing data management for one of the international programs. There are opportunities out there. You just need to, to look for the tendrils of those connections. Um, local NGOs or nonprofits in your, that are working with specific communities in the towns and in the cities where you live can be a really good start. Um, just calling people who are doing what you want to do and asking them how they got there. If you have a whole webinar today with two of us talking about how we got where we are, people will talk to you about the steps you need to take. Um, the traditional job boards, which you probably know about, but one idea that you might not have thought about is actually looking at the funding announcements that are coming out um, of the .gov sites. So many of the organizations who are competing for funds, um, especially if it's a renewal, they'll often post positions they need to fill if they get awarded so that's one way to break into it they've got to suddenly hire a whole bunch of people because they got a new 10 million dollar grant so looking at the funding announcements to then anticipate what jobs are going to be available with different organizations can be quite useful in identifying job opportunities those are my pearls of wisdom or you know swine whichever way uh, you end up looking at it but uh, that's my time I'd like to thank you very, very much for the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Yep. Uh, thanks, Kristen. I am making Sarah the uh, presenter now, and I'm sure that there will be some time afterwards. So if folks can um, type in their questions in the chat box on your control panel, that would be great. Um, Take it away, Sarah. Great. Um, like Chris and I would definitely like to thank Beth and Rachel for organizing and putting this together. Um, Kristen had some really great tips and an interesting background, so thank you for sharing that. I'm going to try not to repeat uh, too much. I, I especially love that last slide looking at funding announcements. That's something uh, that I've never thought of, um, but could imagine myself now doing. So like Kristen, I am going to start off uh, talking a little bit about my career path or career trajectory uh, into both public health and global health work. Um, there were several questions submitted ahead of time about the work-family balance, and uh, Dr. Stafford, who's done a lot of overseas work, it sounds like, you know, spent months at a time, if not longer, um, working internationally. I haven't done that as much. I've done a lot of shorter stints or done global health work in the United States, so I hope to offer you a perspective on how um, that might allow a little, if you don't have two years or five years to go overseas, um, that you can still be involved in global health work while living uh, wherever you are now or in the United States. So I grew up in rural Pennsylvania. It was um, the most undiverse place you could possibly imagine. Um, it was mostly a lower middle income neighborhood, people, you know, drove their tractors to school as a joke when I was growing up in, in high school. Um, so I had never left the country uh, before I went to college. My family certainly didn't travel. My parents didn't go to college, didn't know a lot about it. Um, and uh, like Chris and I was really interested in literature going to college and decided I was going to be an English teacher. And my parents, who were really excited for me to go to college and be successful, said, no, you're going to study math or science. Um, and so I ended up getting a degree in biology and one in environmental science and really liked the environmental science part of it. 
um, because it was focused a lot on environmental justice. Biology was interesting, but I wasn't interested in medical school or working in the lab. Um, but during my undergraduate experience, I had a social work professor who took a group of students uh, to Chile in South America. Um, and so I went my sophomore year uh, for three weeks, and it really sparked my interest both in Latin America, Spanish, and social justice issues, which I hadn't been exposed to a lot um, before that. So I was living in an immigrant community in South Philadelphia at the time. Um, during that, those years, immigrant stuff was on the news every single day. Tons of people were coming over the border. Um, and I got really interested both in how immigrants were being treated in the United States and working with people and decided to go um, out to Tucson, Arizona and get my master's in public health. Um, I loved it. I got to work with immigrants on both sides of the border. Um, with farm workers. I volunteered with Humane Borders, which goes out and puts uh, water so people don't die from dehydration as they're crossing the border. And so I got a lot of really interesting experience and experiences that were totally different than my East Coast uh, life before that. Um, and I met a lot of professors who were doing really interesting work. And so like Kristen said, networking and keeping in touch uh, with folks was really important to me um, at that time. So I was working along the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, I looked at uh, women who had experienced human rights violations as they were crossing the border, both as part of my MPH um, practicum, as well as some work that professors were doing, and then looked for an international or global health job everywhere uh, and couldn't find one, and eventually ended up moving to Washington, D.C. and working domestically. I was doing uh, work in education, um, with Central American immigrants who were living in Washington, D.C. So back to that theme of there's definitely a lot of global health work to be done locally or where you're living. And I didn't think I realized it at the time, but now looking back uh, and reflecting on that experience, I learned a ton about Latin America. Um, and I had worked so much with Mexicans and got to learn a lot about Central American culture uh, and people and issues in government uh, as well. So I did that job for a few years and had sort of outgrown it. I was managing, I was a program a manager of some educational programs and really liked it, but there wasn't anywhere to go. It was a three-person organization. Um, and so I moved back to Philadelphia to work on my PhD in public health. And I knew that I wanted to work in the area of gender-based violence. I really um, was interested in that, but I wasn't sure with which population. Um, I, event I originally thought that I was gonna go to Latin America and you know live there for six months or a year and do research, et cetera. And then through TAing a class, which is a requirement of my PhD, I learned about an organization in Philadelphia that was doing uh, health and social service work with immigrants. I'd actually sent some students there in a service learning class and realized that I should actually be working there myself. Um, and so started volunteering with them and learned a lot about domestic violence and intimate partner violence, again, in my local community with an international population. Also during my PhD, I was um, extremely fortunate to get an opportunity to be a teaching assistant in a Costa Rica study abroad program, um, as well as help a professor with some research in India. So I got some additional experiences. Both of those experiences were around gender-based violence, uh, which helped me with my interest in immigration and violence against women uh, together. So like Chris and I also skipped the postdoc and after uh, my PhD, applied um, to a few academic jobs and became a public health professor here in Philadelphia. I'm at LaSalle University. And uh, I have some opportunities to do some international work or global work through that experience. But I also do consulting on the side as a way to keep up with uh, research and, and global health work. So just to give folks an idea of some of my recent and current projects, and I'm happy to go into more depth during Q&A, or sort of offline if people are interested in specific things. But as an assistant professor, I get to teach undergraduate and graduate students. Um, both classes focus on global health as well as classes that I can integrate global health into. Um, and then there's been some opportunities to travel with students, um, which is an interesting way both to combine teaching and networking and research and connections. Um, I just got back from a trip in Kenya, which I think Rachel's mentioned she was in Kenya right now, where I took a group of, of 12 students for three weeks. Um, that organization that I started volunteering with for my PhD research, 
I continue to work there. It's been eight years now. Um, and I have moved up to um, the director of their promotoras, which are community health workers. And so I work with undocumented women who do health education uh, in their own community, um, which has been a really great experience and has allowed me to stay very connected to a global community here in Philadelphia. And then I do various different consulting activities. Um, some of the, the, they're either in research or evaluation, both a, a rapid rehousing for homelessness, homeless men, uh, as well as some work with um, pediatric health access for immigrants and refugees that has been done here in Philadelphia. I've done a couple of in-country uh, programs or, or intervention work in Mexico. And then I recently did the second bullet here, this displaced people in global urban settings was a consultant work that I did in at home for the International Rescue Committee, as well as this last one uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, which I was able to do from home was doing data analysis, uh, et cetera. So I also have some suggestions, and, and Kristen has covered some of these, so I won't spend a ton of time in it. Um, and the first one, which I know we keep reiterating, is do global work at home. Like I, I can almost guarantee that there are international populations near where most people are living, even if you're living in rural places. It's mostly immigrants and refugees who are doing farm work uh, in this country. And the, certainly if you live in an urban uh, place, you're gonna find that uh, immigrants and refugees. So I think doing international or global health work at home is gonna give you experience and also give you some flexibility to either balance family and work or school and work experience life. Uh, my second recommendation would be to apply to a lot of positions. And I definitely agree with Kristen who's saying apply to positions that you're passionate about, but you're not, you're probably not going to get the first job that you apply to. And so if you have applied to five jobs and haven't heard back, I would encourage you not to feel super discouraged that that's pretty common and that you might need to apply to 10 or 20 jobs um, before you hear back from folks. Uh, I have had many interesting global health experiences, but I've applied to at least 10 times as many jobs that, I, that I've been turned down from. Um, again, go to conferences. I especially would recommend uh, smaller or focused conferences. I, or if you go to APHA, you know, really do your research ahead of time and figure out which um, people you do want to connect with. Sometimes those huge conferences I find, can, for me, can feel overwhelming. Um, but folks, like Kristen said, will be uh, excited to talk to you and tell you about their experiences and may have grants or networks or connections that you can um, follow up on. Email or phone people. Uh, I encourage students to do this a lot and they often say, but I don't know, I don't know this person or I don't know anyone there. The worst thing that can happen if you email someone and say, you know, I just read one of your published articles about gender-based violence in Kenya and that is exactly the type of work I would, I'm interested in doing. Do you have any suggestions for me or could I do some volunteer work for you or is there anything I could do to help? The worst thing that's gonna happen is they're not gonna respond, which isn't that really that terrible. No one, I don't think is gonna be mean and say, I can't believe you've written me. You know, folks are busy and sometimes I don't get a response, but most people are pretty receptive um, to having people interested in their work. Uh, I would follow organizations or individuals that you're interested on Twitter. I see a lot of jobs, internships, um, fellowships, grants go up on Twitter, um, so I think that's a good place to, to look for things. If you can volunteer or travel, I know that's not possible for everyone, that the money part can be difficult. Um, I would discourage generally volunteering for places that want you to pay to volunteer. I do see that a lot. I, I don't know anyone who's done that, but I also know a ton of organizations internationally that are helpful or thankful to have people come over. Um, and spend a few weeks or a month or six months with them to get some experience. Kristen covered reading, read books, read articles, read policy briefs, read blogs, uh, etc. Language is a, for me, has been a big one. I'm bilingual English and Spanish, and the Spanish part has gotten me a lot of work. So being able to read or write or converse in another language is really helpful. Um, I know that can be challenging. If you know you're already an adult and you haven't learned a second language, um, but I don't think it's impossible. I was just talking to a 
another professor here in Philadelphia who told me that her PhD work was in Morocco, in which they speak French and Arabic, and she learned both of those languages during her PhD program. She didn't speak them at all uh, ahead of time. I would potentially, if you're looking to stay local and learn a language, recommend Middlebury College's language program. They run some summer institutes, um, which are, I think, six weeks long. I did one several years ago in Portuguese. I got it fully funded. They gave me a scholarship to go, and I learned a ton. Um, so if you're looking to do that and can you know, write up a good essay about why this language learning is important to you, you might be able to get it funded. And then become an expert in some sort of methodology or writing. Um, I see a lot of jobs for folks who can do monitoring and evaluation, a lot of jobs for folks who can do epidemiology and statistics, um, if you can work with big data, if you are a strong grant writer, et cetera, that's going to make you um, more attractive to organizations who are looking to hire. There are obviously thousands of organizations uh, that work in global health um, I've listed just a few organizations on this slide that there are places that I've either personally worked with or have seen doing work in other countries when I've been there working. Um, and so feel comfortable recommending them as places maybe to start looking for jobs or reaching out for contacts. Uh, again, not, not anywhere near exhaustive uh, in terms of, of places that you might want to check out. Um, both Innovations for Poverty Action and Poverty Action Lab Poverty Action Lab is based out of MIT. Uh, IPA is based out of Yale University. Both of them are doing a lot of um, randomized control trial evaluations. Um, both folks who work in public health, work in economics, um, are being hired there and they do a lot of global health work. They ask questions like, uh, is it better to give out malaria nets or is it better to ask folks to pay for malaria nets? Like, in which situation are they gonna be more used? So they're looking at specific research questions. So pretty interesting. Some other things that I would suggest considering uh, on a personal level, motivation, right? So being able to articulate why you're interested in global health work, um, you know, making sure, and I, I'm sure I don't need to say this to this group, that it isn't just to travel or isn't just to do cool things. Um, I've had a lot of jobs ask me this, so I would be prepared with an answer. Um, Think about what sort of commitment you can make. Um, you know, understanding that a week-long trip to do to treat diabetes patients in Central America isn't really helpful to them. People who have a chronic disease don't need, you know, folks from the West flying in and out um, to to quote unquote help them. Um, we're more looking at like that transfer of skills in those sort of situations. And the skills and resources again is iterating. Do something useful. Uh, you know. You don't need to go to Kenya to paint a school. Folks in Kenya can paint their own school. But is there an opportunity to empower or train local folks or transfer one of the skills you have to other people to um, you know, make them more able to do the work that they need to? Organizational, because I feel like a lot of students, I put this in there because I feel like a lot of students are so excited to get any job in global health that they, they'll take it. And this is going back to what Kristen said, do something that you're passionate about. So make sure you know what the mission of the organization is and that you agree with it. Um, one example of this is uh, I was in Ethiopia last year and saw Catholic Relief Services doing really amazing work. There is a drought there and people are starving. They were doing um, you know, emergency food aid as well as doing a lot of agricultural work and teaching people how to double crop and plant in low water situations. But they also don't give out contraceptive or condoms in any of the work that they do because of their religious affiliation, uh, which isn't to say that that's bad. Just be aware of that sort of stuff and make sure that it uh, is in line with your personal values and ethics, et cetera. Look for program or organizational impact. Um, and I'm talking directly about do they do monitoring and evaluation? Have they published those results? Do you know what the money is going for? And is it actually making a difference? Um, and so this isn't so much in research, but if you're looking to get a uh, job in global health uh, with some sort of program or intervention, I would um, highly recommend looking for uh, published and rigorous evaluations of that work. And then thinking about the sustainability of the organization, is that organization committed to long-term work there? 
are in country people being employed, trained, used? Do they have any sort of sustained funding? Uh, is it sustainable in the long run? So I, just before I say thank you, I wanted to pull up, um, I meant to put this in there and then remembered at the last second, just a couple of places where I regularly look for global health or international health jobs. Um, one of my favorites is the IRC, the International Rescue Committee. You can sort of scroll down and see that they have jobs both in the United States as well as internationally in a number of different things. Another one I like um, is DevX. This is not it. Uh, but it should it should be this devx.com slash jobs. Um, a third one is reliefweb.int. They do a lot of postings for international and humanitarian work again. And you, I like this one especially because you can go to experience here on the side. And I know a lot of people ask questions, well, what if I don't have 10 or 15 years of experience, which a lot of jobs are asking for? You can go to the I have zero to three years of experience. And if you're getting a graduate degree, if you're getting an MPH, you're getting a PhD, sell those years of education as experience. And then I'll sure you all know also about uh, idealists, and you can go in and just put a country in this. And these aren't necessarily public health jobs, but there are public health jobs mixed in here. And so if you have a specific region of the world in mind, uh, you can uh, type it in the top here and get some ideas of what's available. Okay. So now I will say thank you, and I'm excited to uh, hear from you guys and hopefully have some discussion or, or Q&A. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks again, Kristen. So there are a couple of questions that are posted on the chat. And um, if we can get to those first, and then we can open up for the question and answer session. Um, first one, are there any specific suggest suggestions on how to get that first job in glo global health that seems to be required? Back door is opened. Back door is opened. So if anybody can answer. Um, Whatever. We have a church activity. Church. Church activity. Move on. Um, I, somebody, somebody is speaking. I'm not sure who that person is, but I need to mute them. Because it sounds like a conversation that's not directed at us. Okay, so to ask that question, are there any specific suggestions on how to get the first job in global health that seems to be required for every other global health listing? And Sarah or Kristen, either one of you could jump in. I, I think Sarah had some, some really good, I, I mean, we both focused on the fact that you can think about global health in a local context as well. And spin your experience, particularly if it's with a particular vulnerable population or key population that you want to work with that you can do domestically. I think Sarah also showed a number of really good links where you can, you know, look for jobs that don't require the experience. So I'll let, I'll let Sarah talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, I would agree and, and would just add that perhaps if you're in school, uh, especially in an, uh, a master's or PhD program, Look and see what folks at your university are doing and then find out how you might be able to work with them. And it might not be, again, going six months to Zambia, but it might be doing the qualitative data analysis on data from Zambia that this professor has already collected. And then you can, you know, start to sell that or, or say that you have some global health experience um, in that way. It, it's a hard one, but I, you know, I understand the hesitation about volunteering. Uh -huh. But I also think it gets you a lot. Okay, so the next question, and I feel like I ask this question frequently, but <laughs> so far it hasn't sunk in. Um, what exactly does monitoring and evaluation mean? And what does a person who specializes in M&E do? Do you want me to start with this one since that's what most of my career has been in? Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. So, mon so monitoring and evaluation is a specific piece. It's a catchphrase 
it's jargon, but it's a specific piece of strategic information in general. So when you think about strategic information, you've got three basic aspects. You've got surveillance, you've got monitoring and evaluation, and then you have evidence building. And the monitoring and evaluation piece of that really is about the systematic collection and analysis and use of information from projects, from programs, from different implementations. And what you're really trying to do, there's a couple of functions. You're trying to learn from whatever you did. Um, it's an accountability function. You know, when you get a project and you say you're going to treat 3,000 people that have been identified as HIV positive, the monitoring aspect of that is how many people did you actually treat? Um, you know, the evaluation part of that is either why you didn't or why you did achieve some of those goals. Um, so monitoring and evaluation really is about a systematic process by which you collect, analyze, and use that information for decision making. And it's a huge part of all U.S. government international funding. Every single grant has to have a monitoring and evaluation plan. Um, it has to be specific. Sometimes it's done internally, sometimes it's done externally, but it's you know data demand and information use, both for evaluating your project, learning from what you've done, and also improving systems and processes. Does that help, or Sarah, do you have anything to add? No, just that while you'll see a lot of consultants or consulting positions for monitoring and evaluation, like Kristen said, um, all government grants and a lot of foundation grants are required to have it, and many of them require an external person to do it. So it's a good opportunity, um, you know, to get jobs in that field. Yeah, and for anybody interested in HIV, I mean, Measure Evaluation is a large multi-organization group that's been doing the monitoring and evaluation for a number of aspects of PEPFAR, as well as some global funds and TB and malaria stuff. Um, you can get a pretty good sense of what's going on from there. But the CDC itself has an entire framework for monitoring and evaluation that I would suggest people just Google and take a look at. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, Yesenia, it looks like you have a uh, an extensive question. Would you care to unmute your mic and ask to get the conversation started? Uh, Yesenia? Are you able to ask your question or should I, I guess I'll, oh, she's calling in now. <laughs> so hopefully she'll be connected in just a second. In the meantime, does anybody else have any questions? Okay, Jacinia, did you join? We've got a caller, can't tell who that is. I don't wanna, use too much time. Jacenia, if you can, just jump right in. But in the meantime, I'm going to start um, reading the group your chat or reading. Sorry. There you go. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, this is Jacenia. Hi, how are you? Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for waiting. Sorry for the disconnect. Um, I had a, I guess my question that I want to ask is, when you applied for your PhD, both Dr. Sherman and Dr. Stafford, did you specifically um, have a focus, a very specific focus when you applied for your PhD? Because it's been very difficult for me to narrow, um, for example, specific infectious disease that I have a grand interest in. So it'd be great to have some insight on what um, the process was like for you and what uh, research you had initially intended on studying. Okay, sure. Um, so again, I know I have kind of a non-traditional path, but it, I mean, it sounds like Sarah did a, a whole bunch of work too before um, doing her PhD. So for me, it, it was very specific. After um, I had about a 17-year career before going back to do my PhD, and all of the work I had done internationally um, 
was around gathering really, really good data to evaluate, you know, to monitor and evaluate our programs and do quality improvement and assess patient outcomes. And I realized that the skill set I was missing was in uh, study design and biostatistics. So I knew that the skill set I needed to acquire to contribute in the next area I wanted to contribute was really in research, epi methods, and biostatistics. Um, now, that said, in terms of narrowing down what I wanted to actually study, you know, when I when I started my PhD, I just wanted to study everything, right? So I did a, I did some projects with um, systematic review. I did some projects with hospital acquired infections. I did some stuff that have absolutely nothing to do with what I ended up, you know, focusing my personal research career on. Um, but it was just really to learn as many different methods as I could. Um, I think the most important thing for me in deciding to go after the PhD wasn't even what my dissertation was going to be about. It was what I needed the PhD for and how I was going to use it. So I knew I wanted part of my career to be uh, research, and I knew part of it, um, I wanted it to be teaching at the graduate level. And to do that, I needed the PhD for the, the universities I was looking at. Um, so narrowing it down is hard. Depending on the field, I know for my PhD, the first 18 months really is coursework and you don't have to settle on a dissertation topic until after you pass your comprehensive exam. I didn't know for sure I was gonna go um, the direction I did. My dissertation was on HIV and aging in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I thought that was going to close out my international career, and it actually launched the next segment of mine. Um, I would suggest as you do this, one of the ways to figure out what you really want to focus on is using your mentors so that the, the people that you're assigned to rotate with, if you do rotations in your PhD, using those mentors to help help you focus down. It's very easy to try and stay very, very broad in the first part of your PhD but narrowing it down um, because a PhD really is about depth of knowledge in a particular area um, can be useful. I hope that helps. I, maybe Sarah can be more clear than, than I am. No, I absolutely, That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh, yes, Annie, I absolutely uh, agree with that. And, and thanks for asking the question. Um, a few other things I might add is that Almost no one I know who applied to do a PhD ended up doing their research about what they wrote in their applications. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but like I wrote about, I was going to do intimate partner violence, very in very specific areas of Peru. I ended up doing it with Mexican immigrants living in South Philadelphia, um, you know, which is radically different. Some specific suggestions I would have is go to the faculty pages of different PhD programs and see who is doing research that sounds interesting to you. And so maybe someone is doing uh, research on dengue in uh, Brazil and that you, you know, you're interested in the Caribbean, but that's not necessarily what, you, you know, the exact thing you want to do, but they have published a lot. They sound interesting. You know, I would reach out to that person because like Kristen said, I think the PhD program is about getting very specific knowledge um, in your area that's going to be your area of expertise, but also really important is just learning some of those. I mean, you need to be able to do statistics, you need to be able to do epidemiology, you need to be able to do um, research and, and perhaps teaching if you're interested in academia. Um, and then, you know, so identify those professors or researchers at the university who are doing work you're interested in, and then reach out to them directly. I think what got me into, and I applied to several PhD programs, what got me into them was reaching out to professors and in all cases going and having coffee or lunch uh, at that school with the professor so that they knew me personally and then they might not have been on the admissions committee but I'm sure they were able to reach out and say oh I'm interested in having Sarah be one of my advisees in the PhD program like I've met her you know I've already vetted her etc and I think it's really normal to change your focus or define your focus like Kristen said after you've finished your coursework uh, in the in the program. Thank you so much. That was very helpful. Good luck. Yeah. yeah, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions from our shrinking audience? 
it's okay. It's evening time. <laughs> it's evening. Yeah. Um, there is one that I'm interested in, although I promise that I did not submit this one. I have distant international development experience more than 20 years ago, but recent experience limited to graduate work in Africa. Also, I'm older, over 60. What are some tips for getting back in under these circumstances? Yeah, I, I liked that question too. It's a great question. Sarah, do you want to tackle this one first? I'm not sure that I have great advice, except for that personally, I'm probably more attracted to that candidate for a few, you know, that I'm probably less worried about them being irresponsible or being like their first time out of country. Um, so I think in some ways the experience and age, you know, I think you need to sell it to work for your, to your benefit. Uh, but Kristen, what, what do you think? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. I think, um, I think a, a balance, uh, showing that you, um, know how much things have evolved since your, your prior experience. Um, and you know, some of the new needs and, and the new, the new, um, environment, but also that maturity that reliability you know factor is huge when i work with people and as we hire people here and i'm looking at who i'm comfortable unleashing overseas um <laughs> i i want somebody with a lot more maturity um you know for for the tasks that i need accomplished so i, I think that can be a real plus Okay, thank you. Well, I, you know, I don't know that we, I think most of the questions that were submitted um, have been answered in one form or another. And I think that you've shared some fantastic information, both of you, Sarah and Kristen. And I just want to, you know, on behalf of the committee, thank you for taking, you know, an hour and almost an hour and a half out of your busy schedule um, to, to join us and to mentor us. And thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Beth. Yeah. yeah, thank you. It's my pleasure. Okay. Well, and, and with that, I think we can go ahead and end. We will have the next uh, webinar in September. So have a great summer, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.